Today is February 18th, 2010. I'm Connie Mason, and I'm at the Quartzstown Waterfowl Museum, and I will be interviewing a Harpers Island native, scholar, and author, Joel Hancock. And I did a test earlier. I have Joel Hancock with me from Harpers Island, esteemed author and community leader and historian. And uh, thank you for coming, Joel. Oh, well, I'm glad to be here. I'm honored, flattered that you would ask. Oh, uh, listen, uh, uh, just for the record, state your full name. and Joel Amber. Grant Hancock. Joel Grant. And senior now that, my, now that my son has assumed his rightful place in, among, the, among the family members. Uh-huh. Wonderful, wonderful. And how many children do you have? We have six. We have six. We have 13 grandchildren and one on the way. Wow. Wow, congratulations. And now, who were your mother and dad? My father was Charlie Hancock, Charlie William Hancock, the son of Charlie Hancock, um, son of Billy Hancock of... of, 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 of oh, of, Sonny of Williamson Red, fame. Renate, <laughs> Renate, fame and renown. Um, my, my father was the youngest son of Charlie Hancock, who moved to Harkers Island from the Banks on Christmas Day of 1900. Had been a store owner on the banks and somewhat of an entrepreneur there and here, and uh, who uh, bought a swath of land that went all the way across the island at, for his family in 1900. And my daddy was his youngest son, and I grew up in the Charlie Hancock neighborhood, part of the Charlie Hancock crowd. My mother was Marguerite Willis Lewis, who was the daughter of Bertha uh, Willis Lewis, who was in. Uh, in many, in every way, I guess the uh, the balance of Charlie Hancock. She was a very strong matriarchal figure, especially in terms of the Mormon Church on Harkers Island. And she had nine daughters, one of which was my mother. And so, uh, and so that was a very strong influence in my life and my mother's life. She she was part of. She grew up in. She excuse me. She raised her family in the Charlie Hancock land, but she wanted to make made sure that everyone knew she was part of the Bertha Willis crowd, even though she had moved a mile up the road. <laughs> Mama said that when she was little, she was she got married only uh, less than one month after her 15th birthday and said that early on, after she moved up to the Hancock uh, neighborhood, she would go out to the road and look toward the west, toward Red Hill, where she was from, and cry. She was so homesick. And <laughs> as I say, it was literally less than a mile up the road. But. Wow. And so what were the boundaries for for the Hancock Well, area. you know, there's a place there now it's near the midpoint of the island called Hancock Landing. Mm -hmm. My grandfather moved there because his wife's parents were already there. They, her name was Emmeline Larson, Emmeline Brooks Larson Willis. And she has, his, her mother had remarried and was living there on the shore. And so my father moved right adjacent and built his house probably less than 50 feet from where his mother-in-law, my great-grandmother Emmeline, was. And so he moved there. Now, they were only there for for 12 years before my grandmother Agnes passed away. Now, um, was that on the backside side? Or it was on the backside side. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just understand. It was not until the 70s, late 60s, that anyone lived on the Straight side. north side, side of, the, mm -hmm. of the island. As my dad would say, one... The south side on back sand, you were close to the banks. Anything you had done on the banks, you could do now still. You know, you worked the same water, you could get out of Beaufort Inlet or Bards Inlet or whatever. And the other thing was, and just as practical was that the southwest wind blowed all summer long, which cooled you off in the summer. In fact, I've heard my aunt Ellen say that lived on the shore that she never spent one night upstairs in Old Paul's house. That she didn't have, have, have a blanket, no matter how hot it had been during the day because of the southwester. And then in the winter, it was just the opposite. When the wind blew from the north, you had a whole island of oak trees, cedar trees, pine trees that was protecting you from the wind. Mm -hmm. So if you were to look at an aerial photo of Harker's Island at any time between 1900 and 1970, you would see no houses on the north shore of the island. Everything was on the south shore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that the south shore really was the main road of the island because it was un unobstructed at that time. No breakwaters, no uh, seawalls or anything. Mm -hmm. My dad used to say the quickest different, the shortest distance between two points is always the shore. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. And uh, Susan told me another one of your uh, sayings on the phone 
So what's that? So you can pick your, you can't pick your family, but, but you can't kill them either, <laughs> or something like that. So you can pick your, you, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. All right, all right. But she said something about it, okay. but you can't kill them either. Yeah. <laughs> so um, and was uh, which which Charlie Hancock was it that uh, uh, was it Charles Sabella did uh, article about him, uh, the folklorist that came down. Uh, was it Sabella or the other uh, fellow that came down? Well, and he did some like some weather sayings from Charlie Hancock. Now, you know that may have been. I'm not familiar with that. My, but you know, Daddy, old Pa Charlie Hancock, the one I was speaking about, my grandfather, he was considered somewhat of a mover and shaker within the community. He was tied up in politics. Mm -hmm. uh, the old boy politics. I used to say he was sort of like one of the characters from a William Faulkner novel. You know that. That when he walked in the room, every it sucked all the air out of it. He, you know, he had his big family, uh, his children and his grandchildren pretty much worked for him. He, deter he, he determined how you voted, where you went to church, and what you did for a living. You were just part of his crowd. Oh, wow. um, and as, and, he, and unlike some of the others, he kept a house on Sh Diamond City almost all of his life. Mm. And so that uh, even though he lived here, this was his main place of you know residence. He kept a little, what he called a camp, and I'm sitting because he fished and stuff there. Mm -hmm. Now he did, after my grandmother died, he started a business with uh, uh, Willard Davis from Davis Shore, a construction business. Mm -hmm. And it boomed for a while in the late teens after World War I when there was an economic boom and before the Depression. They, um, they built like the, the Davis School, the Atlantic School, they built the Beaufort uh, boardwalk. They built uh, several big buildings in county, and they got pretty big. My dad used to talk about the back, the high back chair they had in his office on Front Street in Beaufort. But they got so big that they bid on a school in Morganton, North Carolina. And while there, they hit rock when they when they were digging foundation rather than the dirt that they thought they would be here, and he ended up going belly up. So he lost everything that he had, except for the home place on the island. But one of the places he did lose was his his wife's home place, which was Harker's Point, where Louis Larson had lived, where the, he had established his grain mill there back in the 1870s. And so, so, the, so the grain mill, i got a uh, map here mm -hmm. of Harker's Island. Uh, just it would be right here, or right there. Harker's, Harker's Point, right in there. The, and the, and right if you there. go down the road... There now, you will see, if you can if you get access into the to the uh, compound, mm -hmm. basically there's now you will see still see that bronc grindstone which is about maybe five to six feet in diameter. Oh, really? There. It's still there. It is still there. It is just sort of propped up. It is and it has been there since Louis Larson died in 1872. So if I go through that housing development mm -hmm. when we first come on the aisle, right, and you go through the uh, to the graveyard, past the graveyard. Mm -hmm. Then you see a gate, private entrance. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go down that right at that curve right there is where that is, right under some grapevines and oak trees and fig mm -hmm, trees. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was where Louis Larson, uh, an immigrant from uh, Norway, who came with his best friend Charles Clausen, they were in Do they were in Wilmington, North Carolina, mm -hmm. and met uh, uh, David Yeoman's father, Eugene Yeoman's. Mm -hmm. Who was an older man then, and brought them to Harker's Island. Younger man, and brought them to Harker's Island. That's where, where uh, Louis met my great grandmother Emmeline, and where Charles Clausen married a girl from Beaufort, and he established Clausen's Emporium right. there at the same time. Now, but Louis came, and and we have in our uh, records we have some letters that they had written. They wrote back and forth. One was from Sweden, Clausen, mm -hmm. and Larson Louis was from uh, Norway, mm -hmm. and. Um, in fact, one of the letters is sort of heartfelt. He explains to Emily, this is before the marriage, he says, Charles has been very sick and I don't feel like I can leave him. Well, he couldn't come from Wilmington at that time. Mm -hmm. But he came and he stayed just long enough. He got married in, I think, around 1870. Had two children, including my grandmother, Agnes. And then by 1872 had died. Oh, and, you know, with about the only thing that we have left, you know, are some of the stories that my my great grandmother would tell told my father when he was a boy, for example, that his that his sister's name was Agnes, and that's why my grandmother's name was Agnes. Mm. But you know, Louis was obviously an anglicized version of a Norwegian name. So we have, as as efficient and as uh, dogged as Susan has tried to trace the name Louis Larson to Norway, having left in the eighteen sixties. 
camp for one thing, the way the Norwegians do name there, you know, everybody was a large son, you know, or a Sven son or something mm-hmm. like that, because they used the, 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 the given name of the father became the surname of the, you know, the son. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, so to have them do it. But so we do know that, and we know, and the other daughter that was born was named Lily, was named after his mother. But even that is an anglicized form of it. It may have been Lilith mm-hmm. as a, as a Norwegian. But basically that, you know, all, the uh, only thing that he said, he died of natural causes, which could have been a hundred other things in 1872. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And stuff. yeah. She, she remained widowed for about 10 years until she met Cal Fire Willis and then moved around to the South Shore, uh-huh. which is where my grandfather bought my grandmother. So he could be next to, so she could be next to her mother there and, and where that Willis and Hancock families came together into the world that I grew up in where they were indistinguishable they lived on the same land meshed with the Guthrie's on one side and the Moors behind us and stuff like that and so I grew up in a world where I was not even I just knew I was related or kin as we would say to everybody in every direction and it didn't really matter which way, whether you were second cousins once removed or first cousins or, or anything. We just knew where we were. You could walk in anybody's house without knocking on the door. And everybody was responsible for everybody else's good behavior. So, uh, you know, so that, that neighbor, that Hancock Landing area was, uh, a co- you know, as I look back, I can map out for you about 30 to, to 40 houses that were all related in one way or another with everybody else in those 30 or 40 houses. Wow. Listen, before I forget, let's go back to Billy Hancock a minute because that story, uh, we need that story in this particular collection. Okay. Can you talk about the legend of Billy Hancock? Okay. Now, Billy died in 1914. So my father was only four years old, but he was such a large character that stories were told about him a lot. Um, if I can, if I can come bring you in a circle, you know, Billy, he was, he was famous for several things. One is speed. That's probably the most well, well depicted one. You know, that, uh, According to the legend, as often told by Sonny and others, you know, he was, he knocked the last leg out of the old lighthouse that would turn around in 1858 to be replaced by the lighthouse there. there now. And it was because he could run so fast, they thought that he could clear himself of whatever debris that, debris that might be falling otherwise. You know, you ask yourself, why didn't they do it some other way? But nonetheless, according to that, and Sonny likes to say that he tripped. In, in trying to escape, and so they didn't know how fast he could run, but he could crawl 25 miles an hour. <laughs> All right, but that was one, one of the other things that he would do. Of course, he, he, now he had, there was a certain slyness as well as speed that he would, he would, uh, nest himself to the windward side of a flock of ducks. And then when he would startle them, they would try to fly off, but they always flew into the wind, which would mean to be him. You know, so he could always catch a duck any time that he would like. So he caught He not caught shot. ducks because they would fly towards him and he could call them. So he had to have the hands Now, my daddy's favorite story that was often told to him by his father about Billy Hancock, who lived with, with my grandfather when he came back over here, was that in the, when he was a young man, he had a reputation for playing cat, which was an early version of, of baseball. In cat, however, instead of throwing to the base to get someone out, you had to soak them, which means you had to touch them with the ball before they got there. Soak so, them, S-O-A-K? S-O-A-K. They had to be soaked with the ball. Uh-huh. All right, now, for one thing, they used a so much softer ball. It wasn't hit far or anything, but you had to actually catch them one between bases mm-hmm. for them to be out. Mm-hmm. You couldn't throw and just take the base out. And so he had a reputation, because of his speed, of being great for that on the banks. But in the county, the one who had the greatest reputation, we know, was Sam Windsor, the black man who had lived in Beaufort and would eventually move to, to the banks. And to this day, Sam Windsor's lump is a portion of the banks there mm-hmm. by Dr. Moore, between Dr. Moore's camp and Bell's Creek. Well, so they challenged Sam Windsor's, the team from Beaufort, which had Sam Windsor, which says something itself that a black man was playing ball for them, mm-hmm. which, by the way, what it does tell us was that the Jim Crow world that I grew up in was really, really a, a, a creation after the Civil War and even after the late 1800s when, with, when the separation of equal came in. But before that, you know, that the, there was much more mixtures of the races, including playing baseball here at Carter County and throughout the country as well. But anyway, they challenged them to a game, and Sam Windsor had the reputation as having never been put out. Mm. 
never been put out. Wow. And so his first at bat, he hit the ball to Billy, who was the pitcher was always the fastest man because he had been what most he had been the most obvious one to get a ball. And he was Bill, equal distance from right. the bases. And so Billy fielded the ball and tried, tried to run down Sam Windsor. And he, uh, Daddy, and I can see the emotion with which my dad would describe it, that he held his hand back, pretending that he couldn't catch him until at the last moment, soaked him just before he got to the base, base and put him out for the only time in his life. Now, my dad loved, he, he would become animated as he told that story about how Billy Hancock soaked Sam Windsor for the first time in his life. And Diamond City won the game. Wow. Now, a, a somewhat more, you know, uh, melancholy story is that my dad would tell him, my, actually my Uncle Louie, who remembered him well, Uncle Louie was 18 years older than my father. He was my grandfather's oldest son, my dad was the youngest. That when they evacuated Diamond City in 1899 or 1900 when they came here, he had to leave too. By then he was an old widower and was living with my grandfather, Charlie. And he has, he grew increasingly hung, homesick. And uh, the, in the days of power boats, we think about what, how easy it would be to do that. But when you're an old man and you you can't hold, handle a sail skiff or anything, even though it looked close, I, I mentioned in one of my writings, you know, that uh, Diamond City was as far from him in terms of practical things as old England had been to our great great grandparents when they looked across the ocean. They knew it was there; they just couldn't get to it. Well, anyway, Daddy said that as he got really old, and Daddy called it hardening of the arteries. We would call it some form of dementia now. That he decided to take him out. He would just walk there. So he would just walk out in the water to try to to head back to Diamond City, which was just to the southeast. And my father, grandfather, and my brother, especially my my father's brother, Louis, who was older, they just had to go get him and pull him back. He was walking. He He was was just walking. And said that, uh, and my... uh, my older uncle would tell this with emotion. So, you know, even even though it had been by then, it had been sixty or seventy years since it, he would tell him. He said that as they would pull him back, and he was old and frail, he would cuss him, you know, and and plead with him. You know, what have I ever done to you? You know, he would ask. You know, I just want to go well, you know, home. Yeah, why? That was. I just want to go home. What have I ever done to you? You won't let me go home. And uh, he 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 repeated a. A sort of a mantra that Karen can tell you about seeing, recreating her own life. He would just sort of eventually just look and drop his head and wave at the Diamond City and just wave, ah, Lord, ah, Lord, you know, just thinking. Now, by the time my father died, who lived to be 92, his, you know, he had his own version of that. He would just say repeatedly, son, I've lived in two or three different worlds. And he was just describing about the world even though he wasn't talking about place as much as time, as he was time, because my father grew up there at the end of Hancock Landing. And besides the few weeks that he lived in Beaufort when his father lived there before running away, come back and live with his uncle, he, he built a house 50 yards away from that with the only thing in between where he grew up and where he eventually lived was his uncle, was his brother's house. And that's where he lived for 92 years. So he, he lived in that one little spot. For 92 years, and, but he would always, always say, son, I've lived in two or three different worlds. And I watched, uh, when I eulogized him at his funeral, I thought about it. Has there ever been a generation that saw as much change as my father? Basically, he went from the horse and buggy age to the space age in a lifetime. He remembered the first airplane, a, a seaplane that landed by Academy Field. And people and, and saw that. He remembered the first car that ever came to Arkansas across the ferry from the straits. Mm-hmm. You know, he he re- got married a, only a year before the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Came home from fishing one day with his wife standing at the shore crying, telling him about, about some place called Pearl Harbor. Didn't know what it was. All she knew it was bad. That it was just it was something terrible had happened. Um, he. He watched on you know, his very first television as Eisenhower sent troops into to Arkansas and as Kennedy sent them into Mississippi and Alabama to force integration. You know, he he counted with Walter Cronkite as as uh, hostages were held in Iran. But you know, he also watched Neil Armstrong sit down on the moon at the same time as everybody else in the world had done it. And told me about the first radio that he put in his house. My grandfather looked at it, sort of unbelieving, and said, "You sure there's not a man back there?" 
<laughs> it was one of those large studio, you know, console radios Big and stuff. Ones, yeah. You know, uh, and then by the time he died, he I remember him asking, him, "What is a dot com?" You may recall the dot com, you know, the early two thousand when the dot coms. Mm -hmm. Grew up and then the, the bus that came with him and everyone and used there. Son, what is a dot com? You know, and that all went all the way back from a time before there were. I know. You know, in the world he, I don't mean to make too much of this, but in the world he grew up with, that everything moved at a speed somewhere between what a man could walk and a horse could run. Mm -hmm. Nothing, and, and mm -hmm. you know, and by the time that he died, people were they were we were communicating with a spaceship at Mars, mm -hmm. you know. That was headed toward Mars. So, anyway, yeah. in my I, life, there will there will be changes, but they won't be. I don't think that they will be as dramatic in terms of things. A computer might be a thousand times quicker, but it still be a computer. Right, you know? right. Yeah. I, I thought this about my own mother. I mean, she yeah. grew up. Uh, she was the youngest of nine kids, mm -hmm. and she had to trim the hurricane lanterns at night. Mm -hmm. She had an outhouse, and now she's cooking with microwave ovens and. Mm -hmm. I That's mean, right. it, It's a totally different world. Connie, I was in the third grade when we got an indoor toilet. Really? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, I remember, God, I remember, I I remember that, that well. My brother Mike got married and brought his wife home and he didn't want her to have to use, you know, to use outdoor facilities. So he put in a septic tank and we had, and we got hot water for the first time and stuff. You know, so even if, you know, that my children find that they don't even, not only is it incomprehensible, it's uncomfortable for them to even think about that. Right. <laughs> but in the world that I grew up in, that was just how you grew up in. Mm -hmm. And it and I, it wasn't because we were support. We, we, everybody around me was that way. That's right. That's right. That was the way you lived. Yeah, that I didn't. Was, that was just the way of life. You know, I did. I didn't realize I was poor until I got older. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's happened to all of us, I think. Um, you uh, have written one of the greatest books in the county for uh, history called "Strengthened by the Storm," mm -hmm. which is the story of the Mormon Church and plus the history of Harker's Island. Mm -hmm. Uh, which they all go hand in hand, and and I don't want you to uh, to go over the book because we can get the book, but yeah. but but um, tell me a little bit about the journey about why you wanted to write that. Well, it is a, you know I, the reason why it's a, Josiah Bailey used to say that supply will create its own demand, and he said there was a lot of supply there when it came to that story because it is a you know it's, a, it's an exciting story about Mormon missionaries who came here after the. Uh, at, at the turn of the 19th century, and actually find a home here immediately and started a large group. And one of the things I theorized, or I suggested in my book, it was because of the of the upheaval caused by the storm. People who had broken their bonds with their past, you know, were ready to find something they could latch onto. And the Mormon elders presented such a story to them here. A lot of and, thought it was the end of the world, the yeah, 1899 storm. Right. You know, That's, you know, I tell them it was every bit as disruptive to this area as Katrina was in in 2000. In five that down there, in in that small part of the world, it it destroyed everything that they had known about. Anyway, by 1905, they had established a pretty large congregation. But at, at the same time, there was a great deal of upheaval nationally about the Mormons because the Mormons had the Utah had got statehood a decade before, and they uh, they were trying to seat the first senators who were members of the church. And polygamy was still a hot issue, even though the church had banned it a decade before. And so there were hearings held in Washington, D.C., much like the Watergate hearings that you and I would recall, or the Iran-Contra hearings, that, that was on the news everywhere, even though it wasn't on the air, it was on all the newspapers, and so there was a, stirred up a lot of anti-Mormon sentiment and stuff, including here, and eventually, um, and so there was a group here that decided to rid the island of what they called the Mormon menace, and they burned the church and uh, evicted the elders from the island and forbade the members from meeting on the island, and so I... Uh, where was that first church? Is the same location? It was no if it's where the fish hook, fish hook is now. Oh. Right. On the same side of the road and everything. Yeah, same the exact same location. But mm -hmm. uh that was the the title of that land was one thing that was lost in the years between that and nineteen thirty six when the church was rebuilt on the island at a spot maybe fifty yards to the northeast of that and mm -hmm. had been there near the middle of the islands since then. So mm -hmm. it uh that uh it and and that that was sort of the downtown area of the island. By the, when I was a child, that was where the theater was, the Northern Methodist Church, and stores on every corner there, and that's where the ferry was. Well, one on the ferry was on the north side, and the mailboat was on the south side. Mm -hmm. You know, in that little, and that's the narrowest part of the island. So that was basically the center point of the island. Mm -hmm. So I did, um, 
you know, I did try to re recapture that story. And one of the reasons why was by the time that I was writing it in the late 80s, some people on the island had begun to suggest that it was that it was really, that as told by the Mormons, that it really hadn't happened that way, that it had not been as intense as it was described. In fact, I remember a lady on the island that told me in her word was that it was a, fig, a pigment of my imagination, <laughs> of our imagination. So I, I tried to document it, and I was able to do that from the newspaper accounts and from the journals and other things. And I find that, by and large, they pretty much coincided with the stories that had been told to my mother by her grandmother, by her mother, who was a witness to it, and, and others who were still living. Although by the time that I was documenting, I only had the children of those. None of, uh, I, in my lifetime, I knew some of the people that had that had been witness to it, but I, but not by the time I was writing. I only knew their children. But I did find lots of documentation about it. Did you uh, did you uh, document it by just writing down interview questions, or well, actually, I found the, I, I actually located about twenty journals of Mormon missionaries who were here at the time. Also, the Carter County newspapers and the Raleigh newspapers documented it and stuff like that. And I was able to find in the archives a copy of the letter that the governor of North Carolina wrote to the Mormon church leader who asked for protection. Uh, you know, a letter that was very dismissive of it, you know, that when he said, Our, we don't like your people talking about that. And, and uh, you know, and uh, looking at it in the context of, uh, of, of, what, of, of a generation in that uh, that had not only the Mormons but Catholics and Jews and labor union anybody who seemed to be disruptive of the status quo was treated the same way. It wasn't just the Mormons, but the, I, what I want to document that that at least the Mormon here on, in on Harker's Island, you know, that they were witness to that. Were the Harker's Island Mormons were they the first Mormons on the coast of North Carolina? Well, actually. Uh, the, the Mormon missionaries didn't come to North Carolina until the late 1890s because there had been so much feelings about polygamy and other stuff. So they came in the early 1890s. And it was in 1897 that Mormon missionaries headed to the coast. And so the group down at Hampstead near Wilmington oh, and here and Cresswell up in Washington County are the three oldest, although Cresswell has become now part of the Edenton area. Mm -hmm. But but Hampstead and Harker's Island have been viable Mormon, have had viable Mormon groups ever since the around 1899, 1900 area. So they were indeed the first ones. Now, there were several others, and that one of the things that I postulate in my book is why did, why did Harker's Island last when none of the others, or excuse me, except for Hampstead, none of the others did. Mm -hmm. And part of it was, I think, because of the persecution, because the persecution forced them to decide whether they were aware or were not. It became, as I think this phrase I used in my book, it was a crucible. Mm -hmm. There were 55 Mormons went on the island when the church was burned. Mm -hmm. And when the Mormon elders came back three years later to sort of determine whether it was in, whether there were 50 people still claiming affiliation. And in this Mormon church on the island now that has over 400 members, Almost all of them are the descendants of those first fifty. You know, and and it is because their their ancestors made it. Well, they were forced to make a decision. It, they couldn't be passive about you it. Couldn't be it. on the fence. Yeah, that's right. You couldn't be on the, and that way. And he grew up that way. Now, I, if I may segue from that, mm -hmm. I, on a somewhat lighter sense, I uh, I was the last generation that grew up before television controlled everything. I grew up in a world of stories. Mm -hmm. Old people told the stories. Young people heard them. Uh, and so I was the beneficiary. I heard a lot of stories growing up, and I developed an appreciation that I have had ever since. Perhaps it's evident now. But nonetheless, and so one of the things I've tried to do, because, I, I'm, you know, I, I tried to, to be both sympathetic and empathetic in writing that story about the Mormons, you know, but there's, a, there's some other things, and I don't want to get the impression that I don't love this place like I do. And so I've tried to gather, and over the years I have cataloged literally hundreds of stories, you know, some from the sublime to the ridiculous <laughs> and everything in between. And I am trying to put them together. And I have the stories and I have the details. The, 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 the uh, test has been putting them into a narrative, yeah. you know, where it's not just, well, here's this, you know, a two paragraphs, then a one paragraph, then a three paragraph story. And so that's what I'm working on now. I, 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 I'm trying to weave it into something that uh, would would you know that 
first, I want to put my, you know, establish my place in that where, you know, that I, it is, I am a part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not just an observer, but I am an observer and stuff and how I came to know those stories and tell those stories as they relate to me because all of them do relate to me. Mm-hmm. Some of them indirectly, uh, some, but most of them directly to me. And so mm-hmm. I've, I, I, I've, I've toyed with some names like stories my daddy told me, not because he told them all, but because I heard so many of them in his arms or in his porch or at his landing or in his boat in his or, presence. you know, you know, so I call them stories my daddy told me. Another thing was, you know, I, I love this phrase from a, from one of the letters that Mark Twain wrote where he talks about old voices and old footsteps, mm. you know, because in, you know, in a, uh, in a way, when I hear these, I can hear again old voices. And old foot, footsteps. When I tell that, told you the story about Billy Hancock playing cat or even trying to walk back to banks, I could hear my, I could hear my uncle telling that story. And so, uh, you know, that I, I hope to be the great opus of my life is to, to put those into, uh, into a narrative that can be entertaining and interesting at the same time, right. you know, and, and truthful at, at, at the same time, you know. My mom used to say, hear a story and say that, that that ain't true, and Daddy would say, "Well, it was told for told for the told church, for church, you know, it's, <laughs> and it had a meaning." It, it, right. You know, the reason why the story lived on, it had a meaning. It wasn't just humorous; it had a meaning. It's all sort of like uh, I, I use this example. Mark uh, Lewis had three girls. Finally, had a little boy, and he loved that boy so much that when he would come home and would be would be tied. Just back up and tell us about the boat coming. Okay, the boat. The all right, boat. All right. Well, Mark would see the boat. Well, Mark would tie up his boat on the shore. You know, and again in this world where everything was quiet, no noise, no air conditioning, windows were open. He would holler and say, "Ona, you better hide him." And she knew what he was talking about because when I see him, I'm going to eat him. You know. Well, that was not just a story about how Mark loved Tom Tom, but because everyone knew it, we would say, "Well, he loved her." Well, she loved him as much as Mark loved Tom Tom. Mm-hmm. And everyone knew what, you didn't have to tell the story because they'd heard the story. So that became an illusion that had a meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, if, for example, and I, I, it was a shorthand. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, a, for example, community cultural I had a friend that I found out this week that for the, for the fourth time in a little over years had to move for mm-hmm. whatever the reason for it. Mm-hmm. In my generation, my dad would say they're just like Lemus. And everyone knew who Lemus was because Lemus, it was said, moved so many times that when his chickens saw him coming, they rolled over and crossed their legs. Well, you know, <laughs> so you know you, you've got to be older to realize that's how people move chickens. They would, they would put them on their back, tie their legs, and then put them in a box. You know, you know, not, they did not sound very humane. Then when you get there, you just untie their legs, they would run free. So they said that Lemus' chickens, when they saw him coming, would just roll over and cross their legs. Well, as I said, they didn't have to tell that story. They just had to refer to Lemus, and you, they were knowing that that person does, must have had to move a lot. So, anyway, I want I want to present them in a context that which you know that, that it's not. I don't really need to be a moral in terms of teaching any particular moral, but in other words, it told what life was about. When you were on the line, pulling a lead line and a cork line, you couldn't always explain every time how something were to be done. So you used, as you said, a shorthand mm-hmm. in terms of expressions. Mm-hmm. You know, and now one of the things that I did, my brother has sort of a catalog memory, is once we were coming home from Denver, had a job. And between Denver, Colorado, and Omaha, Nebraska, he re- was able to tell me every the name of every boat from Red Hill to John Gaskell Shoal. Oh and then what the crew was in that boat. Now, this was a snapshot in time, but in the world that he grew up with, you know, who would have been in the Wii 4, who would have been in the Me Too, who would have been in the Barbara, who would have been in the Ralph? What crews worked each one? Because, you know, let's say if there were... Were they long-hauling crews? Is that well, or you know, just... and, and that's sort of the point. Mm-hmm. This time of the year, you know, they would have just been mending nets and stuff like that. But eventually they would have been sink netting. Mm-hmm. Then in the summer, they'd have been shrimping. And in the, in the late winter, they'd have been 
scalloping. And, you know, but everybody in Mort's crew worked with Mort, and everybody in Howard Gaskell's crew worked with Howard, and everybody in, you know, Harry Lewis's crew, as in the Jane Dale, went on the Jane Dale. You'd see, when we talk about the heyday of fishing here, there were a hundred boats, but there were probably 500 fishermen, okay? And that was because Harry Lewis had a boat, and then there were other people that just went fishing with Harry Lewis. You know, he was part of Harry Lewis's crew. And there were other, like, and that's where I said, going back to my grandfather, my grandfather never did any labor, but he had a boat, and he had sons and, and people in the neighborhood that worked that boat. And that's what my brother Tommy was, was able to tell. Now, there was some, some would work this year with one, and some would work this year, some who were better hands than other that everyone wanted to work with. Some who just wanted to go to just, you know, and was lazy and, and didn't get much, you know, and so the next year they would try to get away from him. In fact, uh, <laughs> I've got some stories about that as well, but, uh, but I, 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 you know, and that's the challenge is how do you weave that in to a narrative? You know, and, and I may have to make some, uh, Concessions might have to do a chart now and then, or a list of the stores on the island mm-hmm. and who went to the stores. You're and going most, to need a good map. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's <laughs> one of the things I, you know, that Lily is working on. But I certainly I have in my own mind, you know, where that map would be, where the stores were, where the churches were, and, and, and you know, and where the family centers. You know, uh, by the time that my mom and dad died, there really were only two houses on the island. There were that were still gathering places on every Sunday afternoon. There was Leslie Rose's house mm-hmm. where cars would be lying. It looked like a funeral every Sunday afternoon. And Charlie Hancock's house where cars would be lying. It looked like a funeral every Sunday afternoon because the family gathered there. There was a swing, but there was more than a swing on the porch, there was benches and chairs that would sit outside under trees and stuff. Because by then, when you have 10 children and 30 and 47 grandchildren and by the great grandchildren, there's not enough room on a porch for it. But every, you knew that's where you went to meet. Well, anyway, but in my youth, there were 50 or 60 houses like that. You know, not everybody's house was a house like that, but there were houses that you knew. My daddy's house was the meeting place for the Hancocks. Mm-hmm. Um, Beulah and Bradford's house was the meeting place for the Nelsons. And Leslie Rose's house was the meeting places for the Rose. And then there was a Gaskell, and then there was a Lewis, and then there was the Moores, and there was the Guthries. Everybody had a place like that. Mm-hmm. Again, that, that's the challenge is to try to make that as a part of a narrative. Well, yeah, my grandmother's house was the same way at Crab Point. You mm-hmm. know, she had, they had nine children, and they, and, on every Sunday, except for two that lived out of state, everybody went there. And, and many of the relationships you have with cousins were Happen forged were within that yard right. or close to that yard or something having to do with it or a tree next to that yard or something. Like that, you know, and that's when how Grandmama it died, it stopped. And my youngest sister, who's 12 years younger, I do, doesn't understand the ties yeah. that I have to these cousins because she doesn't know them. That is something we've lost. Now, one of the things that I've tried to foster with mine that I hope I've been successful, I grew up in a world where my cousins were almost were brothers and sisters that you didn't sleep with in the same house with at night. And I, my children are sort of that way too with my grandchildren and stuff like that. But cousin doesn't mean now what it did in the world that you grew up with, that there was an identity place with it that we were all part of that crowd. Now, even though you had to have two crowds because there was a mother and father, mm-hmm. there was one that was the dominant. There was a, there was almost like an alpha male. Mm-hmm. And it was not always paternal. It was sometimes maternal. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, there was an alpha group that Absolutely. you were considered part of. Mm-hmm. To this day, there are people on Harker's Island that would describe me as one of that Charlie Hancock crowd. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Others that would be sports. Karen specific. does that. Yeah. <laughs> Others that would more, be more one of Charlie. Mm-hmm. Charlie Hancock's boys. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I would like to think that there that I have carried on that some people would view my children one of the Hancock crowd, one of Charlie Hancock's crowd, one of Joel Hancock's crowd. Yeah. But it would right. always be the the bro- the broadest kingdom bottom class order family genus mm-hmm. species would be the the one of the Hancock crowd. Mm-hmm. Just as when I go to church and tell Dorothy died, Dorothy Guthrie who died just Chancey's a few years ago. Chancey's wife. wife Dorothy. Until I until Dorothy died, there was still a, someone in church that even though I was then approaching fifty years old, would say, You're one of Dorothy's crowd, referring to my grandmother, mm-hmm. you know, who had been one of the founders, you know, and, and I was classed as part of her and, and and happy and accepting of the fact that I was, and you perhaps you can bear witness to this too, that was a, to be part of a crowd was actually a badge of, it was not a burden, 
No. You know, it was a blessing to, to right. be considered part it's of that. It's a protection and an identity. Yeah, yeah that, that's right. You you know, people realize if they messed with Connie, they were messing with that whole that's crowd. Right. That whole crowd. You know, and, and, and that yeah. was, and so each and each crowd had a certain identity. A certain, you don't, there's certain things, that crowd, they're real stubborn. All right. Or that crowd's real emotional. That crowd's real poor, you know. You know, yeah. you know that that, that crowd's just as, they're the hardest workers ever been. In fact, they you know you, they they're all working no play. Or that crowd, each crowd seemed to have its own the identity, character, yeah, the characteristic that they people focused in on. Uh, now, the, I've heard that there were different sections besides the family names of people. There were different section names. All oh, right, there was the eastern, and there was the western, mm-hmm. and there was the middle. Mm-hmm. Now within that, there were some other. Because obviously, carrying that Red Hill crowd, they were they were all the Western crowd. Mm-hmm. We would sometimes play ball based upon what where you were, were there, you know, mm-hmm. in the three way tournament. Mm-hmm. Mine was right there, and that would extend from the bridge to about where Clarence's store was. That would be the Western, and Red Hill was the focal point of that mm-hmm. where Karen lived. Mm-hmm. From about Clarence's to where Donnie Yeomans or Myrtle's. Store. Well, that was the middle section of the island. That was the downtown. You know, even in Mutt, in the Hancock neighborhood, there were four stores there. You know, I don't, when you think about it, I don't know how did they survive, but there were four stores right at the edge of the road. And then when you went by, there was never, you were never more than 100 yards from some kind of little store that went all the way, that, that went almost to the, to the school eyes where Myrtle, Myrtle's, uh, 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 Myrtle store, or Donnie, uh, Donnie Yuma's store, and she had a restaurant and stuff there. Then, and then from the schoolhouse, where the school is now, we call it still call it schoolhouse. To here, it was called to Shell Point. Yeah, it was called the Eastern. The Eastern. But now within the Eastern, though, there was a little bit of an anomaly there in that. Mm-hmm. From where the Roses lived, until you got to where um, Plymouth Guthrie and the the Yeomans and stuff had been at the very end here to Shell Point. Mm-hmm. There was a group in, there was a little spot in there that was where the Dingbatters lived. I mean, that was where they called it Little Burlington. Okay. Yeah, be, okay. Be, because that was, you know, where all the summer homes. That's where Mr. Cradle built his motel that later became Calico Jacks, oh, you know. Oh. But from, for, from about where the roses were, there was very, you know, except for where Stacy, Stacy Davis had, a, his family was in there and they had a, and they, they, and they was, but they were an enclave within that shoreline where the Chessons lived and, and numerous people that had red clay on the cars because they all came from the Burlington Graham area. It seemed like the Raleigh and the Durham went to the beach or at some other place, but Burlington has always come here. And so you would see that on the license of car, it was always Burlington and Graham here. So, you know, that was sort of a little distinct. Community within the Easter crowd, but where where Plymouth Guthrie's family lived at the very end of the island. That was again, that was the most eastern part of all. But where the Roses and where the Gaskells lived, and then and the Joneses. That was that was the Easter. Where and James Allen lives today. That's right. That was that that was the heart of the Rose Country. That was where George Rose was. Mm-hmm. Then you had where Howard Gaskell, or the there was Clem Gaskell and Howard Gaskell and Ivy Gaskell and all of those that family in there. And then you had where, where John Jones and Howard Rose and, and some some more of them are, and Leslie Rose, the Rose Brothers boat builders. Yeah, where, where were they? Yeah, yeah, that was all the Eastern. Okay? okay. Now in the middle, you know, you had that you had the Hamiltons and the Hancocks and the Moors and the Guthries and the Lewises, and and then in the Western you had the Willis. You had Willises everywhere, for some <laughs> but especially had the Willises and Lewises and and. Uh, and so at, at that end of the island, and then you had some Whitleys and, and some Brookses, especially Brookses mm-hmm. down there. And mm-hmm. But it, you know, you know uh, f- even fifty years ago, if you said a name to a no, to someone who lived on the island, they would immediately identify with a with a certain part of the island. Now, obviously, by the time I came along, there was no distinction because they all they all ran together in terms of houses. Uh, mostly, it was where you if you if you did you if you. If you went to buy Pepsi's and bread at Clarence's, you were at Western. And if you bought them at Dallas's or Edith's or Norman's, you were at the middle part of the island. And if you bought them at Tommy Lewis's or, um, that, you know, down the other, you were at, you were at Eastern. How about that? You know, uh, just to tell or you. Or especially Earl, Earl Davis's was the big one at the middle. Right. You know, but, yeah. Uh, just to tell you that, that it, it looks like it's a, a pattern. I uh, uh, spoke with uh, Danny Styron about Cedar Island. They had seven stores. Mm-hmm. 
seven stores. And I said, how can that community that size sustain seven stores? But they could because walking distance. That, that, that's, the, that's the thing. No one drove to the store. If you couldn't walk to it, you couldn't use it. Right. So it had to be close enough. The other thing, they had a pretty, they had, you know, they had no, they basically had no utilities other than just a light bill. Mm-hmm. You know, there were no bathrooms or water or stuff at the store and they heat by a wood stove and they, they, you know, and they, you know, they didn't have a lot of overhead expenses. There just were taxes. No, tax, no, no taxes or anything like that. And they, uh, they didn't, is, and they lived off of the, what they had in store because the main thrust of living was just being able to feed yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, they, I thought the people in the store were rich people because they could have bread anytime they wanted. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it, but it, it is amazing that we can't support a Dollar General now. Mm-hmm. But, but we could support, uh, them at one time, there must have been 12 to 15 stores on the island. That were also, they, they all came together in cabs <laughs> in Eastern Variety. It became sort of the collaboration of all of them at, yeah. at, for, for that one brief, that, that brief, I guess, maybe decade or more. Cab became our Walmart and, and Food Lion all combined. And, and do, you, do you remember that? Do you remember? You sure you I do remember Cass, and because uh, Karen's father would be there with all the yeah. guys sitting around. It, talking. Some people called it Eastern Variety, but to us it was mostly it was cabs. Yeah. If you went there and he didn't have it, he would have it next time, and there was a good enough chance he would have it. It was worth trying. Mm-hmm. And if he didn't have it, you bought, still bought bread or milk or something while you were there. So, and the community was, gathered there. It was the gathering place. You found who called fish today. You know, where are people going tomorrow? In fact, I've seen them there when the long haulers would get there together and sit around that table and draw lots as to who would get where when. Oh, that's where they would do it? Yeah, they'd do it at Cab Store. Now, of course, before that, they had done it at other places, RJ's, or like that. But, but by the time, by the by the 80s, it was Cab Store. Oh, they were it. still do, still drawing lots in the 1980s? You know, I'm not sure. Lots. They don't do it right now for long haul. Really? Yeah, that they, because some places are better than others. Everybody, yes, and for channel it. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody can't have the same channel that hole all the time. So that was the way that they were able to self-govern and about that to avoid trouble with it. Well, I know my dad told me about the, uh, the drawing the lots and uh, uh, and then the different halls down by Stacy, and he there was a name for every one of them, mm-hmm. and the the people who were buying the fish kind of knew where everybody was going, and so they would go and find them. You know, and buy the fish from them. Mm-hmm. And Roy Willis could do the same. Uh, did the same thing for me the other day. So, but I had not heard it was happening down here. I don't know why I didn't think it was. Yeah. Well, see, you know, because the island has more tide because of Bard's Inlet and Beaufort Inlet than any of the down east areas and stuff. So that Channel Net in particular is big here and up the sign, you know, toward. From, from Davis on, so they they don't they wouldn't even think about channeling because they don't have enough tide to run for it. Mm-hmm. But the biggest shrimpers here are are channel netters. Mm-hmm. The biggest trash shrimpers up there are trawlers. Now we do some trawling here, but they don't they don't do any channeling as, as far as I know. They don't do any channel net there. And and channel net, but obviously you got to be at a certain place. You can't do it everywhere. Mm-hmm. But there's only like five or six places that you can do it. So you'd have the way you turn to get there. Right. Right. Well, that's interesting. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, uh, let me just ask you, when, when you think about living and growing up on Harker's Island and you think about uh, a meal, mm-hmm. what's the one that just kind of defines what a great home-cooked meal is mm-hmm. for you? Well, every meal included light bread and potatoes of some sort. It was just what went with it. And in my house, you know, there, was, there, was, there would be shrimp. And there would be flounder and you know, or fish of some sort and stuff like that. How was well, the shrimp fixed? The shrimp were stewed most of the time. Mm-hmm. That was because they, they were shrimp in gravy with potatoes, like Susan does them for mm-hmm. them here and stuff now. But there were sometimes fried shrimp and sometimes boiled shrimp. You know, especially if you were in a hurry and stuff. But the and and baked fish was usually baked, baked flounder, or baked or or daddy would, a sturgeon or something mm. like that that it would get. And then oysters would be steamed and stuff like that. But when you asked me what was the best meal, the one that if I were going to face the hangman's noose and they gave me one, it would be stewed hard crabs. Stewed hard crabs. Stewed hard crabs. And let, it, let that juice drip off your elbows. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's you know that you know when I eat hard crabs stewed like my mother did and like my sisters do, you finish because you're tired, not because you're full. You can't, but you know you stewed. Sometimes they would put shrimp in it, and sometimes they would put wild onions and stuff. But the main thing was the potatoes. And the gravy, 
with the stewed hard crabs that you would suck out of them. As a, mm. So now there was a story about Loke on the island that loved loon, stewed loon. Mm-hmm. And they said that Loke loved loon so good that when they would finish the loon, he would just hold the pot up and drink the juice. Oh. Okay. And then when he would finish, when he could no longer do that, he would put his hands in it and rub it through his hair. <laughs> he let it shine his hair. But anyway, so... Growing up, people would say, so-and-so loved that more than Loke loved Loon. Just like I would say, more than Mark loved Tom Tom, okay? Mm-hmm. You know, everyone had heard the story, so everyone knew that's how much Loke loved Loon. Now, how do you spell Loke? It was Loke as in smoke, but it's spelled L-O-C-H. L-O-C-H. Like Loke Lot Loman. Yeah, yeah. But he he was called Loke. Loke and Lemus and Dalton and that crowd, they were all... You know, and I thought about one of the little, little things that was sort of off the subject here, but you know, in the world that I grew up with, and, and I'm not sure that we're probably, town drunks were accepted, were an accepted part. There was, you know, I can, I can name probably five or ten people that mama would just make, stay away from him. Stay away from whatever, or so and so is drunk. You don't, don't go out, don't go in the front yard. You know, I see so and so coming down the road. And it was assumed, you know, you just stayed out of their way. And most of them, they were just jolly when they got drunk. Yeah. Now there was now and then an incident where someone got mean or something like that. But it, but it was only to, it, at that time it was to settle an old score. It didn't. There wasn't a uh, because of something he did while he was drunk. But nonetheless, I thought about how that would be would be different. And what how my children hopefully grow up without ever seeing anyone publicly inebriated. But in, I grew up in a world where you, but there were just certain people that you knew, especially on Saturday night or on Christmas Eve or something like that, so-and-so was going to be drunk, mm-hmm. and you were supposed to stay away from them. Right, right. Uh, I heard uh, somebody say that uh, when uh, the bridge was built and the mailman used to come here instead of by boat, mm-hmm. if it had big packages and stuff, that you could catch a ride with the postman. Have you ever heard that? Oh yeah, to to uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You're talking about when, when, when that that yeah. Now, obviously, before that, with the mailboat, the mailboat was in fact was. a ferry, mm-hmm. you know. But yeah, I, I've heard about that. that uh, you know that plus trailways put a bus that came over to the island every Saturday morning, hmm. and then would come would come back at three o'clock every Saturday afternoon for for going to town. Now, town meant Beaufort, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, that was the case. Now the other thing was that kind of you remember when hitchhiking was considered an acceptable means. I would go back to East Carolina sometimes, or come home from East Carolina hitchhiking. Went to many ball practices, even ball games. How about you know, you would put your stuff and you would get out by the road and you put out your thumb and you know and then, and you knew who that was. You know, because not every family had a car. In fact, most churches didn't have parking lots. You know, because people walk to church, or, you know, or, or if they came, they they pick it so that j- you would just park on the road in front of the church. How interesting! I hadn't ever thought about that. Uh, but you know, the Harkins Island Church. I remember when we when we covered up our ball field to make it a parking lot. How convenient it was, but what a tur- what a tr- turmoil was involved. You know, why, why? Because there was just no more room to park. They were parking in yards next to it because because so many people. My daddy never had a car until I was in college. Mm. Had a boat all my life. Had several boats at the times. Mm-hmm. Never had a car. You know, it was there was, it was it was assumed that one crowd only needed one car because you didn't need it every day. And you could you know and and if I needed to go somewhere, my sister would take my daddy or my mother mm-hmm. or you know that, that each crowd just had you know or sub subset of a crowd had a car. <laughs> Talking about boats, uh, did your crowd build boats? My daddy spent most of it probably from about 1960. Well, late fifties till the, he retired in early seventies. He was he worked with the high tide boat work with Julian Guthrie. Oh yeah, yeah. Before that, he had worked with James Gilligan son. But before that, he was mostly a fisherman. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I was the youngest of ten. But, but I remember him mostly as a full time boat builder and a part time fisherman. Mm-hmm. My older siblings remember him as a full time fisherman and as a part time boat builder. The, his his big boat that he worked had been built by Brady Lewis. It was the Ralph. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, but yes, he was. And then when I, in my high school years, I worked with Julian during the summer uh, with Curvis Guthrie and my brother Telford and and Eddie Julian's son and stuff. We we would work over there building boats. The summer before I got married, this was after I graduated from college. I, my daddy, who was a really good friend with James Rose, they were the same age. 
talked to James Rose one day at the store, and he agreed that he knew I only had to work for six weeks. So James Rose let me work with him. So I worked with James and and uh, um, Earl Rose. And, of course, that was pretty easy. Me called Peter, Weldon Edward, who was from my neighborhood, one of my cousins, one of those cousins I didn't know how, but were cousins. He was the foreman there. He was James Rose's son-in-law. And so he was pretty much in charge of, 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 of giving, finding me something to do to keep me busy. But I'll never forget the day that I left to go to work, to go home, to take a shower, to go to Greenville to get married the next day. Uh, wow. You know, I was making like a dollar seventy-five cent an hour, and when I when I left, Peter said, "Come here," and he was sitting uh, on the, one of the pilings at the landing, you know, or one of the the things that we used to, to prop up boats when we were putting them off. And he opened that wallet and gave me a fifty-dollar bill, Ooh. and told me to enjoy my honeymoon. But you know, that fifty-dollar bill was more than I make in any one week working there. But even with that, I still borrowed hundred dollars from my brother for the. So I had $150 on my honeymoon. You were, you were, you were, you <laughs> we, were padded. We, we, spent, we spent a week at Beach Mac on that $150. Well, that's great. And, and when is your anniversary? It's in July, July the, July the 6th. Susan July and I will have been married, uh, 37 years. Wow. This year. And, and so, what's, uh, Susan's, uh, maiden name? Susan is a Leggett. She's from Greenville. And she Leggett. will, she oh. would tell you, and I think I would tell you that, that those 37 years have been four or five of the happiest years of her life. <laughs> <laughs> She would she put she would she wouldn't make any bones about making that statement. So she's from probably around the Leggett Crossing area. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Actually, the um, Rogerson Leggett's the the North Greenville side where I guess would be Pactol, Stokes in that area. And there. Right. Her her father was a tobacco buyer, Carolina Leaf, Mont, Bohaman, and those wow. other companies and stuff. Wow. Her and her f- maternal grandfather was a civil servant. He worked at he was clerk of court. Uh, an appoint when it was an appointed thing in, in Pitt County he had moved there from Whiteville. He was a Formy Duval from, mm-hmm. from the Whiteville area. But yeah, she's been here since 1976, and you know there's well, she fits right in. And there's some people some people still think that she's uh, that the you know we're still not classify her as an Islander because she wasn't born here. <laughs> well, she's uh, she's got uh, everything going for her. I'll yeah. tell you that. Uh, and she and did did uh, your mother take her under her wing to teach oh, her how yeah. to cook? She was she was as close to my mother almost as I was, you know. What, and um, and I heard your mother was just a very amicable and happy person. Laughter was you heard her laugh before you ever saw her. She laughed all the time. In fact, it was sometimes frustrating as a child. I would I would try to be a conscientious student. If there was something I couldn't do, I would you know what's your first thing? You ask your mother. She would just laugh because she didn't know any more than I did. And she just found it so humorous that I didn't know and that I had asked her. One of her favorite things when she would write letters to her, one time six of my siblings were living away. And there was no, we didn't have a telephone, so she would write them letters. And she was sensitive that she might not spell things right, so she would leave blanks for me to help her fill it in as I got older. Mm -hmm. And sometimes she would forget that there were blanks there and just mail the letters. (laughs) You know, so she would she would mail letters, and so the letter the responses would come. Please tell me who it was that died, or tell me what it was that so and so did. You know, because she had just left a blank in the letter. So. But it would, she would be reminded of those things. All she did was like my daughter Leah is the most like her in terms. She looks like her, shaped like her, and even she just laughs at everything that's humorous to her. And and your children are musical too. Does that, does that right, run in your family? Right, well, oh yeah. All well. Uh, uh, Susan, their, their mother, you know, is musical, and um, Mama's, my mother's family was musical. So they played the piano, not having, not by, not by music, but by note, you know, by ear. Mm-hmm. But uh, all four of my daughters teach piano. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Emily was a voice major. Joella was a piano major, and Leah was perhaps the most musical of all. Uh, it came so easy to her that she didn't feel like she had to study it. So she, she studied design and stuff. Said Al is the photographer, really, of, of the group, but she plays piano in, 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 in the church where she is uh, there as well. The boys all play guitar. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, they, they, they probably enjoy music as much or more than the girls, but they do it, you know, as recreationally rather than uh, professionally. Right, right. And did, uh, 
Uh, did your grandfather or Billy Hancock or any of those guys play music? Or did they didn't have time? Really, well, right. Now my daddy loved to sing. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, do you remember singing along with Mitch? Sing along oh with Mitch? yeah, with the I can remember ball. hearing my daddy at night. He would you know, he would think we were in the bed, and you know, and this came on late at night, but sort of like the Tonight Show or something. My daddy singing downstairs, and for Christmas songs and stuff, he pretty much took the lead in the singing and, and stuff. He lo he loved to sing. Um, I'm not as musical as that. For one thing, I've had hearing problems all my life, which have hindered me in terms of being able to keep stay on note. And, is that congenital, or is it, or did just some did you, you know, have a sickness, or? I had it, it is the result of repeated infections that were untreated when I was little. I grew up in a world where he, earaches were something you just endured. You know, you didn't go to the doctor for an earache; you just waited for it to get over. Mm -hmm. By the time that I got over it, as a as a, a, a adolescent or teenager, the nerves and ends had been damaged so much that they, you know, that they were they, there was no recourse. Even now, as you tell, as I sit here today, I'm wearing two hearing aids. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking of that. Uh Doctors, when you're growing up, uh, were most of them located in town in Beaufort? Or? Well, you know, Dr. Moore was in town, and he was the one that, that when he had, Daddy would take me to his camp because I didn't feel like he had to pay him if he went over there. But Dr. Moore and Dr. Fulcher were basically, Dr. Moore from, from Marshburg, Dr. Fulcher from Stacy, they were the one. Dr. Fulcher delivered me, Dr. Moore tended to me all the life. Dr. Salter, Dr. Lewis later on, but my, Dr. Moore was the center was the one that treated me most that I recall. And I remember <clears throat> when I got my physical to go to college, he was puffing on a cigarette and said, I despise these damn things. As he sucked it in his mouth, said, don't ever start these damn things. I can't get yeah. <laughs> But um, he was, Dr. Moore was, if there was a king of the world, it was Dr. Moore. For one, he would, he was a brilliant family doctor. And my mother thought he was the handsomest man in the world, bright, white hair that was slicked back and he wore starch shirts and a and a starch and a dark suit all the time mm -hmm. handsome and and smart and and no, no arrogance about him at all and would come to you guys and would tend to people even they didn't have any you know he'd say if you'd say if you haven't if you've got money pay and if not just go on you know, you know, and that was sort of the attitude so everybody loved Dr. Moore right, right. Yeah. and that's Judy Spitzbergen's Judy Spitzberger, by the way. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Fulcher was, you know, he was something like that that, that way, too. And he was from Stacy. And, then, you know, I'm sure his family took advantage of him. Mm -hmm. That people, as much as the people from Marshburg and Harkers Island took advantage of but him. But he would never, they would never go hungry. Oh, oh no. No. You know, and they, uh, oh, that's right. You know, and, you know, that's how people paid him, by and large, and stuff. Yeah. In fact, Fred Guthrie here on the island took care of Dr. Moore's boat for him and we fished a boat for him mm -hmm. and would you know and, and take chairs and stuff to him and, and it was called Fred, Fred it was Dr. Moore's boat it was named the Judy mm -hmm. and you know why oh yeah for yeah. His, yeah. his daughter well we're almost out of tape but I want to tell you that I thank you so much and there there's another tape we've got to do <laughs> if you wouldn't mind uh, later on because I want to talk to you about the mail boat and some other things and mm -hmm. and uh, this has been great and uh, I'm not going to keep you more than an hour. And okay. I'm going to close it out. Well, thank you, kind of. Again, I'm flattered that, that you would ask me again. Oh. I, most of the stories, are, you know, I've heard from family members and stuff. They're they're pretty much a part of me. I want to encourage you to get that book done and get that map done because I'm I've been working on a map too, and this will all be uh, in the archives here. So, you know, uh, Maddie Willis has has. Mm -hmm. You know, and James Allen has put some things on maps for me, so it might be helpful for you later on when you're getting ready to. to, to and look when, and when I do compile my list of boats and stores, I'll give you that as well. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thanks, Joe.